Good morning. Welcome to Friday, March 27th of TA11's distance learning lecture series. I hope all of you are well. It's been a bit of a week, has it not? All right. Today, we are talking about scenery design. So we are going to be building on what we learned last lecture in theatrical architecture. I think it's probably worth taking a moment or two to define some terms. The stage or the theater is the permanent architecture of a theatrical space, whether it's arena, proscenium, thrust, et cetera, et cetera. The scenery or sets are the temporary creations that fill the stage or the theater for a particular play or production. So we tend to use the words sets and scenery interchangeably when discussing theatrical design. And we refer to the artist responsible for these creations as set designers or scene designers. One thing too to take note of, when we talk about the creation of scenery for theatrical production, we talk about it as building a set or building the scenery. Okay, so let's start thinking like set designers. What are the goals of good scene design? I feel that there are basically three. The scenery designer has to create the physical world of the play. What I mean by this is the set or the scenery is typically the first thing that an audience sees when the curtain rises or when they enter the theater space if it's not a proscenium house. So the set gives an audience immediate clues about where and when the action of the play is going to take place, whether it be a castle or a small New York apartment or a subway platform or the surface of the moon, whatever it's going to be. Beyond that, Good scene design is going to communicate the style of the production to an audience. So that's the mood, the emotional vibe, and the degree of realism or abstraction that we are employing in this production. And thirdly, good set design is going to serve the director's vision and be part of that unified whole of what the director is trying to communicate to an audience. I forgot, there's a fourth one. The set design is also going to have to serve the needs of the script. More on that later. So there are about 11 zillion ways to do that, but there are at bottom basically two kinds of scenery. The scenery can serve as a background or it can be an environment. What do I mean by this? Okay, background scenery is two dimensional. So think maybe if you acted in or saw um, productions in grammar school or middle school, you would see actors on a stage and behind them on the back wall of the stage, there would be a painted curtain depicting a street scene or a forest or what have you. That's background, right? So the actors are standing in front of it, not interacting with it, but kind of like standing in front of a picture. Environmental scenery is three-dimensional. So there are physical forms that jut out into that playing space and surround the actors, and the actors can interact with that. Background scenery or two-dimensional scenery is what most scenery was like from the ancient Greeks through the 18th century. If you think back to those photos and videos from last time of like the theater at Epidaurus or the Globe Theater or even that Vienna Opera House, you can see how you could have two dimensional scenery, a painted drop or a series of painted drops in front of which actors would perform. But in the 19th century, when we became interested in realism as a theatrical style, we needed our scenery to behave more like real life. So we needed things that we could sit on and climb on and pick up and interact with and doors that would open and lights that would turn on and off and things like that. So we created more of an environment. But environmental scenery doesn't have to be realistic either. Here's a really lovely example of scenery as background. So you can see it's rather realistic. It's um, what we would call a trompe de l'oeil effect, right? A trick of the eye because these two-dimensional paintings are very beautifully carefully rendered so as to create the illusion of three-dimensional space. And we would call this actually wing and drop set, the kind of 
tall rectangles that are coming in from the sides. Those are the wings. And then the vertical kind of canopy of leaves coming down from the top are called the drops. And the big square piece of painted scenery, which is that ma major feature, that's also a drop, right? Because it's dropping down from the ceiling. So as you can see, actors would stand in front of this and it would look like at any moment they could walk down that path towards that beautiful sunset. But of course they can't, right? This is like Wiley e. Coyote stuff. But here's really beautiful wing and drop set as background. And this is from the 18th century. And here is an example of an uh, environmental set design. This is from A Streetcar Named Desire, which is, you know, a mid 20th century play. This was um, performed at the University of Houston School of Theater in the early 2000s, so early 21st century. And so you can see how like the scenic elements surround the actors, they can interact with it um, and really engage with the different scenic elements. They can walk up those stairs, open the doors, open the shutters on the windows, they can open that teeny tiny fridge, they can sit down at the table, blah, 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 right? It's a much more interactive set for the actors to do their work on. So if the set designer is given an empty stage as a starting point, their job is basically to manipulate that empty stage and manipulate reality to create impactful design that fulfills all of those goals that we just discussed. So how can they do that? Well, first they have to think about how they want to fill that space. So they need to go back to the text and they need to ask themselves, what kind of space or spaces does this play create? What do I mean by that? Is this a private space or a public space? You know, are these scenes taking place in a restaurant, which would be public? or in somebody's bedroom, which is private. You're gonna have different things, obviously, in, in each of those kinds of spaces. You're gonna ask yourself, is this set in a historic time period and is it important to recreate that moment of history or is it contemporary or does it matter, right? And then you need to ask yourself, you know, is this taking place in America or some other specific geographical location? And does my set design need to reflect that culture or geography? So you need to ask yourself, is this a real space or is it imagined space, right? Lots of plays take place in places that exist only in the imagination. They could be in the future or they could be in somebody's subconscious or they could be, you know, in a pineapple under the sea for all we know. And lastly, we need to ask ourselves, you know, does this play require a very realistic kind of setting? Is it important that this story be told in an environment that behaves like reality does? Or does it need to be more abstract? Some examples. This is a set from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. So this is a very public space. This is you know, Rome before the Senate building. This is where Caesar is about to be murdered. You can see Caesar in white there surrounded by the senators who are about to stab him. But check out this space, right? It feels like a public space, does it not? It feels like a government space, do you think? For me, it does. Thinking about those marble steps and columns, and it feels very, you know, similar, but not quite like Washington, D.C. public buildings, you know, has this kind of weight of official authority about it and that it's kind of designed for the public to be impressed by. And you can see all of those kind of symbols and slogans about it that feels very political. Some elements of this space are quite realistic. Look at that beautifully painted marble. Some of them are quite abstract. Those kind of cut off walls that don't go, you know, it doesn't really create a realistic looking building, but just gives us a sense of like majesty, right? And then, you know, the symbols and slogans that are just kind of hanging from space, hanging from the sky. So we've got kind of both realism and abstraction going on in the same design. Um, but we're definitely getting the ceiling of a public space. Now contrast that feeling with this 
set design from the Diary of Anne Frank. That play was about real people and a real point in history and a real physical place that you can still visit even today. So this is a much more realistic set than that Julius Caesar one, but it's also, you know, a much more intimate space. It's private compared to that Julius Caesar space because this is a family home or a makeshift family home, right? It's it's the hidden rooms behind a factory office um, where Anne Frank and her family hid for several years. Um, it's not entirely private, right? Think about this in your own home. You have rooms that are more public spaces, like your living room or your kitchen, and you have rooms that are more private spaces, like your bedroom. And so because this was two families plus um, another family friend all sharing this space, it is both intensely private, but also kind of public in that there's no place to escape from these people. So this set design is really trying to recreate that sense of public slash private slash hidden. You can see that it's also quite crammed with things. It's very realistic in terms of recreating as much as possible what the actual Frank secret annex looked like, but also a little bit abstract because if you look kind of behind that kitchen table, you can see like the plaster and lath um, of the wall, those slanty lines. Behind those is a bedroom space. I think that's Peter's bedroom. And some of the action in the play takes place in that room. And so the wall has been kind of partially removed so that an audience can see into that space, even though the other characters could not. This is the scenery design from the play Picnic. This is a real outdoor space. So it's kind of private because it's somebody's backyard, but it's also kind of public because it's outside, right? And we're getting the sense of this shared space in between these two houses. And here's another very kind of specific to a historical time period and part of the world. This is a Victorian gentleman's drawing room from the 1890s in England for the play, The Importance of Being Earnest. So it's very kind of meticulously period correct, um, but it's also very carefully and artfully arranged to tell us about the personality of the character that lives in this space. And here's a completely imaginary space for Cirque Dreams Pandemonium. I don't know even what it's trying to recreate here other than we have deliberately skewed um, proportion of things and things are not at you know, proper right angles. Things are a little fluid and kind of melty and a little screwball-y kind of psychedelic kind of Dr. Susie, but not quite. So this is a completely imaginary space. And this is rather lovely, or at least I think so. This is from a play called Lighty Breeze. And that play takes place on the island of Nantucket in 1895 in a house. And so we have some elements of a house that's kind of crumbling and falling apart. And we kind of get a sense of a beach that kind of looks like Nantucket with those rocks and the sand and the wooden floorboards and then the sky in the background. But this isn't a quote real house, right? This is obviously some sort of metaphor or high abstract concept at work here. This is not how real houses look, even if they are rather crumbly. So this is an example of a set design kind of giving us more than realism really could. You have that big giant picture frame behind this house. You have this, you know, sense of overwhelming things kind of pressing down on this small girl in this space. You have the natural world kind of creeping into the man-made world of this house. Tell me how you feel looking at this. And Maybe even more importantly, try to tell me what you might think the girl is feeling if this is her reality. All right. So another thing that the set designer can manipulate is the scale, which is how big or how small the space is or how big or how small the space feels to the human beings that are in it. 
So when we're talking about manipulating scale, we're always using the human figure as our measuring stick, right? So think about like Alice in Wonderland, how she grows and shrinks, right? The set designer can make very, very tall doors. Doors that are 15 feet tall are gonna make Alice appear much smaller than she is. Or if the set designer makes a door that is three feet tall, then suddenly Alice is a giant. Even if the actress playing Alice is still the same size throughout. Kind of related to space and also related to scale is how empty or how full you make that stage is gonna impact the sense of scale as well. For example, this is a really vast, open, empty space for a production of King Lear. And when you have big, vast, open, empty space, the individual human being in that space looks rather small. So here is, I think this is Gloucester, who's been blinded, who's just kind of supposed to be alone on this barren field and just feels like he might even be the last man on earth. In contrast, this is a play called The Curse of the Starving Class. Again, it's a realistic interior with a kitchen, but look at how kind of cluttered and tight that space is that these characters have to move around in. And you can just kind of feel already how tense they are with each other because there's literally nowhere for them to move. Then you have a play like Cats that is set in a junkyard and where the human actors are supposed to be you know, house cats. So people who are five foot to six feet tall are supposed to be cat sized. So the way to kind of make that illusion work for an audience is to take all of the things you might typically find in the junkyard and scale them up so that a five foot to six foot tall human standing next to them or sitting on them looks small in comparison. So you can see kind of like that giant box of Kraft macaroni and cheese and the bike wheel and the car battery. All of those things are you know, like four to six times the size that they would be in reality to make the human beings look smaller. A third tool that scenery designers can use to manipulate reality to create a meaningful set is to look at texture. Right? Audience members typically don't touch things in a set design, but they can look at things and imagine how they would feel, right? So texture is all about what things look like and what they feel like. So dealing with textures, we can have natural textures or manufactured textures, right? So natural textures are wood, stone, grass, leaves, those kind of things. Manufactured textures are things like glass, steel, plastic. Things like brick kind of go in between because yeah, brick is made from natural occurring things, but it's been, you know, treated by human beings to make it into something else. Wood, even though we manufacture it into, you know, floor planks or furniture or what have you, we still consider it a natural texture. So beyond natural or manufactured, we can say, you know, is this a heavy or is this a light texture? Is this translucent or opaque? Meaning does light come through it or is it, you know, kind of solid? And color works in here too. Something else to think about here, I don't have the word on here, but it is in your vocabulary list along with this learning module, is um, sometimes we want things to look distressed. And what that means is that we are kind of manipulating materials to look old or dirty or bloody or worn or otherwise used. As a basic rule of thumb, Natural textures tend to read as warmer. Um, they tend to be more uneven in terms of like each one is kind of individually shaped, right? Either by mother nature or by, you know, wear and tear. And they tend to be rougher as in not uniformly smooth. Whereas manufactured textures tend to feel colder they tend to be slicker and they tend to be much more uniform because they've been manufactured. So think of the difference between, you know, a wooden floor versus a concrete floor. And I think you get this sense. So here's an example. This is from Les Miserables. 
and we've got some wood, we've got some stone, we've got some textiles from that laundry hanging up there that's kind of part of the scenery, and it's all quite distressed to look gritty and worn and kind of miserable, right? So it's communicating that sense of desperate poverty. So it's mostly natural materials, right, which have obviously been, you know, manufactured into cobblestones and to brick and to doors. But compare those textures with these much more obviously manufactured textures of metal, glass, and concrete, and how this creates a really cold and steely vibe. So here's a set design from As You Like It. This is the Forest of Arden. So we've got very natural looking trees, um, and we've got a forest floor that has been painted, or I think some leaves maybe scattered on it to make it look like a real forest floor. And we're even kind of using light and haze as a texture to kind of create this romantic, soft, natural feeling. Contrast that with these manufactured textures here for waiting for Godot, right? We're using the concrete or asphalt of a road. Yeah, there's natural textures in the background there with the kind of scrub from what looks like a vacant lot but check out the tree in the background there that is obviously some sort of steel like coat tree or something like that where they've got some very obviously not real leaves hanging from it and then cardboard piled up underneath it so my guess is the set designer here took a found or environmental space, which is kind of literally a vacant lot with a parking lot or a road or something in the middle of it, and then added a few key elements like that tree and the cardboard um, to create the set design. And the last big element that we're talking about here for what you can manipulate is levels, right? Creating different places for characters to move. The empty stage is likely going to be all one level, the stage floor. Some stages um, have a floor that's partially or completely removable to kind of like an underfloor layer so that you can create a pit. Um, and obviously different theaters are gonna have different heights for the ceiling. So your amount to kind of level up is gonna depend on how tall that ceiling is. But set designers can create, you know, multiple heights on their stage by building sets that are different heights. And we use these levels to help us define a space. We are creating power structures here with this. If you think about this in character relationships, if someone is standing above somebody else, when we look at that, we get a sense of the taller person is the one with more power. This also helps focus an audience's attention. If we have things going on at different levels, we can focus the eye of the audience on one level by bringing the lights down on another, or just by changing the height of somebody kind of draws the eye away. And having different levels and having different places for people to move to. And the last big element that a set designer can manipulate to build their set is by an artful use of levels. The empty stage architecture is likely all one level. We have the stage floor. There may be empty space underneath that stage floor that can be partially removed or sometimes even completely removed and built over so that you can have kind of like a subfloor, like a trap door or something. It may be that the stage floor is literally the floor of the building and that's it. And then your ceiling height for your stage space is gonna vary. Some theaters have very tall ceilings and others have very low ceilings. So depending on what your ceiling height is, is gonna determine how many levels you can get or how high you can build your set design. But it's very useful to have different levels, even if the levels are only a step or two higher than each other. So why is that? Because you wanna have places for characters to be able to move about on a stage. And having different levels is going to just kind of multiply your options for creating dynamic stage pictures and interesting compositions for the director. Another thing with levels is that having different levels can help create and communicate power structures in character relationships, right? If one person is noticeably higher 
than everybody else, we are going to assume that that higher placed person is also kind of socially more important, or at least has command of the power dynamic in the room at that moment, right? And if someone is much lower than everybody else in a given moment, we're going to assume they have less power. So having different levels on the stage can help reinforce that. And lastly, having different levels in your set design is going to help focus audience attention, especially when there is a change in where characters are vertical wise. When we see a change like that, it's going to automatically draw our eye. So here's a design from a production of Romeo and Juliet. So check out how many different levels there are in this space. We have one, two, three, four, five kind of steps, right? Two small ones that take up most of the stage space. And then we've got like the three little steps up to that platform where we've got a character standing. And then you've got a set of steps behind that kind of, I don't know, piazza colonnade. And then we have the balcony level. So if you look at this, right, we've got several characters on that bottom level. We've got one character standing on that kind of middle level, and then we got one character standing way up high on the balcony. And you can kind of see, right, our eye is drawn all the way up, 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 up to that center top, kind of like the apex of a triangle. But as you can see, with this set, there are about a zillion places for characters to be at any given moment, and can draw our attention. Just think about a character kind of running up or down those steps or popping in and out of one of those arches on that upper level or even on the lower level too. There's lots of interesting possibilities for stage blocking and business here. So here we have a very non-realistic fiddler on the roof design. And we have a literal fiddler on a literal roof that is very abstractly hanging in the air. And so that kind of draws our attention. And this designer kind of turned our expectations on our heads, right? This is where the floor is the highest level. And they've kind of built a maze into the underground or the subfloor of this. So now the highest placed person is the one standing at floor level and everybody is beneath them. So in addition to all of that, thinking about space, scale, texture, and levels, the set designer needs to make sure that a set design is suiting the practical needs of a play. So they really need to pay careful attention to the script and see what the script is asking for. Things like exits and entrances. There's a play called No Exit by Jean-Paul Sartre. That set design Per the script's very explicit instructions, it's supposed to be like a living room, but with no windows and only one door. And that door can only be open from the outside. So characters enter this set through this door, and then they cannot leave unless someone from the outside opens it for them. Contrast that with a play called Noises Off, that's set in a country estate, and the text of the play requires that there need to be two stories with two sets of stairs. There need to be at least four doors on each of those stories. They're going into different rooms of the house and then one door on the bottom floor is the door to the outside. And there needs to be at least one window on the bottom floor. So, you know, some of those doors go into bedrooms, some of them go into a kitchen, one of them is a closet, one of them is a bathroom, right? You have to make sure that the set has all of those in it because a lot of the blocking is all about people, you know, running into closets and hiding behind doors and popping out of doors and scaring people and all kinds of stuff like that. So if you were designing a set and it doesn't fit those needs, you're going to have a disaster when you come to your blocking. So scripts are full of clues about what the architecture is going to require, whether it's doors or steps or windows or other things, um, pieces of furniture and other props other things that are going to help us indicate a location or a time period or even a time of day and other clues for the set designer to incorporate into their design. Also, the set designer needs to look at the script and see if the scenery needs to change over the course of the performance. Some plays are fine with just a single set that just is what it is. We call that a unit set. 
And some players are going to require the scenery to change. So the designer needs to ask themselves, you know, how much needs to change in between any given scene? And then they need to say, you know, where can this scenery be stowed when it's not on stage, right? Some theater architecture is going to lend itself to that more easily than others. The designer needs to ask themselves, how can I change the set effectively to show a different location or whatever it is, but it needs to happen quickly and smoothly because audiences really hate sitting and waiting while there's nothing happening. And then you've got practical things like, you know, is there a curtain to close while the scenery can change? Or do I need to have performers or technicians perform the scene change in full view of the audience? Then you need to talk to your director because then the director needs to kind of incorporate that into the blocking so that the audience doesn't lose their attention while the set change is happening. So there's lots of stuff to think about in the script before you go ahead and design your play. For example, the play Dancing at Lunasa, the set needs to include indoor space and outdoor space, and the audience needs to see them at the same time. Because sometimes there's someone like yelling out a window for someone who's outside. Or you can see a scene that's happening in the kitchen while somebody else is outside doing something else. And those need to be happening at the same time so the audience can see them. So here is one set designer's answer to that problem. A very realistic Irish cottage. That's an environmental set. There's lots of really gorgeous, natural textures in here and you've got the sense of indoor and outdoor and then you can see kind of it's almost like a like a science model they've kind of peeled back the layers in this sort of abstract way so that the audience can see inside that cottage if you're designing Romeo and Juliet you're gonna need a balcony you're gonna need to have that level it is super important to have that in this play because the whole point is that Romeo and Juliet really 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 want to get together and it's really 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 hard for them to do it if it's all on the same level and they can just be with each other you lose all of that dramatic tension Here's that play Noises Off that I was talking to you about. Here's, you know, a whole bunch of doors and the windows and the staircase. This is a great play. You should check it out. It's quite funny. There's a movie version of it available on Amazon Prime, but this is quite a lovely farce um, where there's all kinds of frenetic action going on that without a set design that takes care of all of that, it would just suck. But wait, there's more. Whatever awesome ideas the set designer comes up with, and however faithful they are to the script, you also have to be serving the director's vision. The director is going to have their own take on the play. They're going to have a specific message that they want to communicate to the audience. And the designer needs to keep those ideas in mind while making their own choices. For example, Hamlet by Shakespeare, right, takes place in a castle. The name of that castle is called Elsinore. There's a line in that play where somebody says, Denmark is a prison. So lots of times directors say, I really want to communicate that sense of prison to the audience without turning the castle of Elsinore into a little literal prison, right? It still needs to be a castle, but he really wants to communicate that sense of prison to an audience. So a set designer might kind of enhance that vibe by using, you know, distressed gray stone, and they might have black iron grill work on the windows, and they might make kind of very cramped and damp spaces. And so even though it doesn't say, you know, county jail, the audience is going to see this castle and still get this kind of like prisony vibe from it. If the set designer were to create an open, airy, bright, and cheerful space for Elsinore, they wouldn't be deserving that director's vision, even if this design met all of the practical needs of the script in terms of, you know, doors and windows and furniture pieces and blah, blah, blah. So we're getting into things like theme and mood and style and the emotional resonance. So all of your awesome set design ideas have to kind of fit with the director's thinking on all of those areas. So here's a kind of cool design for Macbeth. Costumes are kind of setting us in a medieval time and place, but the set is a floor that is the map of Scotland. And then you can see those kind of tattered heraldic flags in the background there. So this is a very, you know, imaginary space for the world of the play. 
but it's very kind of emotionally resonant for an audience. Here's a set design for an opera called L'Heure Espagnole, which is the Spanish hour. I've never seen this opera, but I'm getting the sense that time might be an important theme that goes on in this opera. Okay, this is one of my favorite plays. This is The Cherry Orchard by Anton Chekhov. It was written, oh, about 120 years ago. Um, it is about a Russian aristocratic family. They have this gorgeous family estate that has a cherry orchard in it. The cherry trees haven't produced cherries in years. So it's this beautiful estate, this beautiful orchard, but the family is deep in debt up to their eyeballs. And they have this kind of gut-wrenching choice. They can either live in this crumbling estate that isn't very useful to anybody and be impoverished, or they can sell it. And if they sell it, they're going to cut the cherry trees down and build like low income housing, basically. So it's this tension between, you know, beautiful and useful. So the cherry orchard itself is talked about by characters all the time. It's very much in their mind all the time. In many ways, that cherry orchard is a symbol or a metaphor for the old, genteel, beautiful, and useless aristocratic way of life that is slowly dying. So you could have a very realistic set that is, you know, the interior of a old Russian country mansion with a view of a cherry orchard outside the windows, or this non-realistic set where the interior is just kind of implied, but the cherry orchard itself is kind of omnipresent throughout. It's creating almost the walls. One other thing I want to point out to you here is you can see how um, part of the stage floor is on an angle so that it's higher at the back of the stage or upstage and lower at the front of the stage or downstage. We call this angling of the stage floor um, a rake. And this was done back in earlier centuries when we were using mostly background kind of sets. And it kind of helped reinforce that trompe de l'oeil um, effect of teasing the eye. This designer isn't using trompe de l'oeil background sets. This is still very much an environmental set, right? But they've incorporated that raked stage floor. And I think it's probably here to kind of have the characters present themselves as being a little bit off balance, that they're they're trying to keep things on an even keel, but life, even the force of gravity, is working against them. For me, this set design makes a really powerful case for the awesomeness of non-realistic setting. Okay, so how does a set designer communicate their amazing ideas to a director, to other actors, and to the technicians that are going to build their set? Well, they could do a research morgue. This is a collection of research images and ideas that the designer has organized in a way that they can talk through and people can understand what they're talking about. A set designer is going to have to create a ground plan. This is a scale model of looking at the stage floor with all of the scenic elements in place as if you were looking at it from the ceiling down. You know, this is like those blueprint architectural plans. Um, and it will say, you know, like three feet by five foot platform that's going to be, you know, six feet left of the center line of the stage. And your theater technicians will know how big and how tall to build that platform, and they will know exactly where it needs to go on the stage floor. So this is also helpful. A ground plan is helpful for the director and the stage manager to use when they're blocking. Um, in the rehearsal room, they will often use tape on the floor to kind of tape out the dimensions of the stage. And you know, if there are steps or platforms or other changes in levels, they're going to mark those out with tape so that the actors know basically where to stand, even if they don't have the three-dimensional pieces in front of them. Um, a painted elevation, that's um, a drawing or a painting of looking at the scenery as if you were standing right in front of it. So looking at it, you know, vertically. Um, that's important for your scene painters to know what they're doing. And, you know, if you're building pieces like molding or trim or other things like that, or putting a window in or things like that, that helps your um, carpenters as well. 
And the last thing is a set model. And that is a small scale, three dimensional kind of foam board or cardboard, almost like a little dollhouse of the set. And that's important to communicate ideas to your technicians and to your director and to your actors, because that's really the closest you can get to seeing what it's going to actually look like before it's made. So here's an example of a research morgue. There are lots and lots and lots of examples of ways to do this, but this is for something called a librarian. And this is someone who looked very carefully, you know, at architecture and libraries and lighting elements. And there's even a bit of whimsy in all of this. And so they're trying to get, you know, what do I want this library to feel like? You know, they're gonna take all of these ideas and then make their design from them. Here is a ground plan. This is for um, a production of Hedda Gabler. So you can see, right, it's that bird's eye view looking down. You can see um, that curved edge at the bottom is the apron of the stage. That black line about a third of the way up is the curtain line. You can see those dark shaded areas um, about a third of the way down on either side of that dark line in front of it. That's showing you the kind of physical edges of the proscenium arch. So anything in between those two um, shaded areas is what the audience can see through that proscenium arch. And as you can see, they've built some other walls. That's the dark shaded areas that you can see. You can see the sense of levels. You can see like that dotted line that's showing you um, stairs all the way upstage towards the top of the image. And then you can see they've drawn a sofa, a table, a piano, a window seat. Um, and anybody looking at this can kind of get a sense of what the traffic patterns are going to be in this, where entrances and exits can take place, and where and how actors should arrange themselves on this set. So this is probably quite a realistic set design. And we call this kind of set a box set, in case you're curious, because it's almost like, you know, those dioramas you probably made in uh, grammar school social studies classes, where it's like, you know, like a literal box where you've removed one side of it and you can look inside and everything's all set up. This is an elevation of a very similar set. I think this is also for Hedda Gabler, but it's not the same set design. But as you can see, we're looking at it head on. So this is like if the audience were peeking through the proscenium arch, this is what they would see. So you can see the piano, you can see the stairs up to those doors, you can see the window, you can see there's a space um, at the back there, kind of behind the what looks like a fireplace, right? And you're getting a sense of, oh yeah, I get you know what this space feels like. And if this elevation were colored in, then you could give this to your scene painters and they would understand how to paint the walls and the floor, etc. Here is a set model from a design for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom by August Wilson. So this is the three-dimensional small-scale model. They've included human figures in it, and that's super important because it's really hard to understand scale without our measuring stick, which is the human being. But you can see, you know, they've made the levels clear. They've made the textures clear by painting these so beautifully. You can see the individual pieces of furniture, whether it's the doors or the stairs or steps up to things. Um, and a real sense of how big, how small the space is, and where actors can move about to tell the story. This is a set model for Endgame. So you're getting a real sense of texture and color, right? This is intentionally very sparse, stark color. Um, very industrial, washed out grays. Um, and also showing you light and how that kind of communicates the mood on this design. Okay, um, technical difficulty, don't know why the top line of this slide is cut off, but I will read it to you. This is a white model for All My Sons by Arthur Miller. And what a white model is, it's a model that hasn't been painted yet. Um, so it's kind of often a rough draft of what the model is gonna be, right? Compare this one to that beautifully painted model for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom just a couple slides back. So even though it hasn't been painted, right, so we're not getting the full sense of what it will feel like, we're still seeing scale and spatial arrangements. And importantly here, we're seeing actor-audience relationships. This is obviously a three-sided thrust space that we're in because you can see those black 
tiers of seating on either side, and presumably at the bottom of the image here would be the third set of seating for the audience. So it's really important when you're making a model that you include where the audience seating is going to be so that we understand how the set reacts to the audience and vice versa. Okay, so the next few slides I want to show you um, are all from film adaptations of Shakespeare's Hamlet. And it is the same scene, which is act one, scene two of Hamlet, um, but it's how different scene designers and productions have tackled this idea. Things you need to know about act one, scene two, it is the throne room of Elsinore Castle. So it is a public space. It's a royal building, right? Elsinore is the seat of government for Denmark, but it's also a family home. But this room is a very public kind of official government space within that home. Now, when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, he wrote it in the late 1500s, early 1600s, but it was set, you know, in a much earlier time period about, you know, 1000 AD or thereabouts, um, but Shakespeare wasn't a real historian, so he wasn't necessarily trying to be historically accurate. But, you know, we generally accept that Hamlet is set as sort of like ye olde medieval times. Now, the designers for each of these plays, some of them are medieval, some of them are decidedly not. So they were making choices about where they wanted to set it historically. Um, but they were also dealing with kind of like different levels of realism. Some of them are very representational of a particular period in time, and some of them are more presentational. So ask yourselves, right, give yourselves a good long look at each one of these and ask yourselves, you know, how did the designer manipulate scale, texture levels, and space? And how public or private does each space feel? Um, ask yourself, you know, did the designer choose a particular place or time and by place I mean like geographical place on the globe okay um, they're all in a throne room um, but so did they narrow down on a particular historical period or a particular culture or country to kind of set their scene and how realistic or abstract is each space and probably most importantly how does each set design make you feel what do you get a sense of about these people about the world they live in about the events that are likely to unfold in this space so this is the 1990 movie version of Hamlet, which was directed by Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth Branagh is himself there in black, starring as Hamlet. Um, and Tim Harvey was the production designer. This is the 2009 Royal Shakespeare Company's production of Hamlet, starring David Tennant. Gregory Dorn is the designer here. Quite a different feeling from that first slide I just showed you. This is a scene from Franco Zeffirelli's 1990 Hamlet starring Mel Gibson and Francesca Lo Schiavo was the set decorator. Sorry, this one's blurry, um, but this is another shot of that same film, the Zeffirelli Hamlet throne room. You can see Gertrude and Claudius on their thrones. And here's act one, scene two from the National Theater's 2015 production of Hamlet, which stars Benedict Cumberbatch as Hamlet. Ed Devlin is the set designer. <laughs> 